Joseph Farah at World Net Daily is publishing it. I've worked on it for two years, and they're editing it now and looking through it, and Joe and I did a great interview over the weekend, and he asked me some questions about it. But the point I'm making is, in those years, we were all, he said, what were you doing in those years? I said, well, I was, I was a seeker. I was a searcher. I was looking for something. And he said, well, were the 60s all bad? I said, no, they weren't all bad. In fact, they were all good. I said, it was the communists who came in and took the innocence of the 60s and warped it and turned the, uh, the, the kids, the young people who were looking for something beyond themselves, something greater than themselves, and turned them into little mini communists. So you could say, well, was the hippie movement all bad? No, it wasn't all bad. Look at the music. Some of it's great music. Some of the art that came out was gibberish and garbage, but some of it was mind-expanding, so to speak. But you have to be open-minded to understand that. You could sit there and say, oh, nonsense, just hippie garbage. Yeah, okay, fine. You could have those attitudes and be a moron your whole life. Or sit there and smoke a cigar and make believe it has no effect on your health, like you're God and you're not going to be affected by smoking a cigar or eating cheeseburgers day and night, like you're different than other human beings. You can be as ignorant as you want. You could dismiss an entire era, an entire movement, an entire philosophy, an entire religion, because that's stupid and easy and bigoted. It's easy to be a bigot. Bigotry is the easiest thing to, uh, to follow. Do you know that? Bigotry is the easiest thing to follow. And it's hard to open yourself up to new ideas and new things and new, and, and new um, patterns. So I'm getting back to religion. What is religion? What is religion when you come down to it? Why are we even talking about it? Because it was injected into yesterday's uh, caucus. And it was, it was, as far as I'm concerned, too much of it was for show. It offended me. It offended me both as a voter. It offended me as an American. It offended me as a man who believes in the separation of church and state. I didn't want to hear about religion yesterday, to be honest with you. Now, many of you took umbrage with that. You think that I'm rejecting religion. I'm not. I'm rejecting people who are using religion to sway you. That's what I was saying. I don't think you understood that because, you know, it's like two legs good, four legs bad. That's what's going on here. It's like Animal Farm. I feel like I'm walking an animal farm right now. Oh, you're not for the program. You're against the program. No, I didn't say that. So this is sort of a, uh, a discussion of why I have such a distaste for people who bang Bibles while running for office. It really disgusts me, to be very honest with you. And I didn't, I didn't appreciate it. You know, keep your religion to yourself, more or less. So you say, well, why don't you? Because I'm not running for office. I'm not looking for your votes. If I feel that religion speaks to the news of the day, I will in, include a Bible reading from time to time. I don't do it every day. I'm not looking for your vote. I'm trying to show you that to me the Bible is a living entity, sometimes. Sometimes I'm not interested in it at all. Sometimes I don't believe in God personally at all, not at all. I lose my faith. It comes and goes. I'm not one of these 100 percenters. In that sense, I'm very much like Mother Teresa, who admitted in her last uh, months she admitted, point blank. She said she was guilty that she didn't always believe in God, and she felt very bad about it. She was a totally honest woman. She was a saint in that regard. She was totally honest. She said, I didn't know if God existed. Some days I didn't feel that he existed. Some days I did. Well, that's very human. So you get a politician who says, oh, yeah, God's with me every minute. It reminded me of Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter may as well have been there at the caucus yesterday with the snake and the, and the, and the strychnine. That's what bothered me. You understand yet? Can I get this or not? No, I don't think I, I got through. So those who understand this get it, and those who are diehards and fanatics won't accept no matter what I say. They think I don't like religion, I don't like God. That's not what I'm saying at all. And secondly, it's my business anyway. It's not yours. So why am I talking about it? Because it was introduced into the election yesterday and the day before and the week before and the month before, and I hope we don't have to put up with this any longer. I think I'd rather hear about what their plans are to save the military from what Obama is doing to it and has done to it. I'd like to hear their plans for closing the borders and stopping the influx of illegal aliens with or without diseases. I would like to hear about their, their plan for destroying the greatest threat to our survival that we have faced in our lifetime called ISIS. That's what I'd really like to hear, which are exactly the questions I asked Donald Trump 10 days ago, by the way, right on this show. And I love all those people say he's not specific enough. Well, he answered the questions. Maybe I have to play the interview again for you to hear the answers. 
all of the, the great conservatives in the media, the National Review and the Weekly Standard, apparently they don't listen to me. I don't exist to them because I'm a, not a member of the club. Oh, him? Well, who's he? We don't know him. He's not one of us. We don't care what stations he's on or what he's written. We don't care that he's a national treasure. He's written 30 books. He's not one of us. We don't know him. We don't recognize him. In that sense, they're just like the Soviets. All those fools with inherited money and foundation grants who never worked a day in their life. The Bill Crystals, who without his father's money would be working in a, in a Starbucks if he was lucky. He wouldn't have been able to put enough money to get it to, to, to have a, a single pizzeria in Brooklyn, let alone uh, function as a great intellectual. With, with Bill Crystal, weekly standard, hates Donald Trump. Why do they hate Donald Trump so much? What do they hate about him? What, they're the true conservatives at the weekly standard? Are you kidding me? Why do they hate him so much? Because they don't own him. That's why. Just as they don't own me. That's why. So having said all of that, now let's get back to work here. Yesterday was interesting in that uh, Ben Carson was very angry at Ted Cruz for the dirty tricks that Cruz's group played in Iowa. And in fact, Cruz admitted he did it. Listen to clip number 11. It's very important you hear it. At uh, many of the precincts, uh, information was disseminated that uh, I was suspending my campaign, that I had dropped out. And uh, anybody who was planning to vote for me was wasting their vote, and therefore they should reconsider. I mean, if, if Ted Cruz doesn't know about this, then he clearly needs to very quickly get rid of some people in his organization. And if he does know about it, isn't this the exact kind of thing that the American people are tired of? Uh, why, why would we want to continue with that kind of, you know, shenanigans? Uh, okay, and today Ted Cruz admitted that some of his people did it, but he says he didn't know about it, right? Isn't that what he said? They were just wild cards doing it on their own? Yeah, I don't believe a word of that. But, again, you want a litmus test. If Cruz is the nominee or Rubio, I'd vote for them over any Democrat. So can we go past the litmus test? It doesn't mean I happen to like the candidates very much. Then Rubio gave a speech that I think is worth hearing in clip number one four. Fourteen, please. For months they told us we had no chance. No. For months they told us because we offered too much optimism in a time of oh, anger we had God. no chance. No, For months they told us because we didn't have the right endorsements or the right political connections off, off, off. we no, had no voice chance. Is, no, voice is no good. Like a, like a child. A high-pitched voice all of a sudden. What happened to Rubio? Well, what, where'd the voice come from? And he doesn't have the right voice for the presidency. Hillary Clinton sounds more manly than him. I'll be back in a minute. For months they told us we had no chance. For months they told us because we offered too much optimism in a time of anger we had no chance. For months they told us because we didn't have the right endorsements or the right political connections we had no chance. Send Fredo off to do this, send Fredo <laughs> off to do that. Let Fredo take care of some <laughs> Mickey Mouse nightclub somewhere. I can handle things, I'm smart. Not like everybody says. <laughs> like dumb, I'm smart and I want respect. So Rubio is the, is the Frito of the campaign. When you think about it, let's put it in the Godfather analogy. Trump is Michael Corleone. Cruz would be Sonny Corleone. No, who's Sonny? We know that, 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 that um, Rubio is, uh, is Frito. But who's the godfather of, the, of all of it? Why, that would be Adelson running Rubio's campaign from his Las Vegas uh, empire, high atop his gambling empire. He's definitely behind Rubio. They're all behind Rubio. They, he's safe. He wants open borders. He's the Republican establishment candidate. It's anyone but Trump. Anyone but Trump. That's why they want Rubio. So uh, you're going to see Rubio come up from the from the rear on this one. Excuse me, did I say that? Uh, coming up from the, well, whatever. I, don't, I can't use that here. But nevertheless, come up from behind. No, I said that, that's not right either. Well, he'll come up from uh, as in, in the back of the race. I got to be careful here in the Bay Area. I, I can get accused of anything. You say one word with words in it that they think you're saying something else. So they're all gloating that Cruz and Rubio highlight the GOP's non-Trump path, and they're calling him a loser. How come they're not calling Sanders a loser? Why are they saying Trump is a loser not saying Sanders is a loser? The real loser is Hillary. If you want to know who the real winner was, it was Bernie. He had almost no money, 
and he he almost won. They stole it from him. The real loser is Hillary. The people are not uh, taken in by her. But you know, it's so early. Rubio's not gonna you know stop making believe he won. He didn't win anything yesterday. He came in third. But I'm going to close with something that uh, uh, that no one else has said yet. It's an analysis that can only come from years of studying data. And I study data from the point of view of epidemics and disease. And I had to learn statistics, pass exams and data analysis. I want to remind you, I'm a statistician to a certain extent. <clears throat> you could say that uh, uh, Ted Cruz won, which would be true. And you could say that Trump came in second, which is true. But what you're not seeing is that had there not been a Rubio, Cruz would have beaten Trump three to one. Admittedly, that's a horrible thing to say, but that's what would have happened in that anomaly, that, that anomalous state called Iowa, where the Caucasian caucus certainly is not representative of America. It is a Caucasian caucus, not representative of America. Let's see what happens in New Hampshire. Good night. Savage.